Greetings ladies and mental gents, and welcome to my channel, where I like to make audio narrations of stories from across the internet. In this series we will be focusing on a web novel called There is no Epic Lucia, only puns, from the website Royal Road, and in this video we will be doing chapters 48 to 50. I hope that you enjoy. There is no Epic Lucia, only puns, chapter 48 Equal system. A mime? Rudy opened her mother's icebox and rummaged for anything that hadn't been seasoned to the point of inedibility. Her mother always did go with the method of never too much spice when it came to her food. Rudy preferred an abundance of sauce on her charred meat. Yep, a real mime buried in all of that rubble and rock. Delta was just doing her thing and out it popped a ghoul mime. If you would believe it, Rudy pushed aside the lure lizard leg and a autumn fox strips, the old salt stag rump, and finally, and the hunter strikes again. She smirked as she pulled out a delicious blood hair jerky, an elusive animal that even Rudy had a somewhat hard time tracking down without some serious effort. But boy, they were mouth-watering when they were lightly cooked to a juicy red. Rudy licked the back of her drool as her mother walked around in the small kitchen area with a skull. A scavenger, more like it, coming into my home and helping yourself. I raised a wild animal. She grabbed the small knife and began to cook the meat with some lot veggies. Rudy was highly tempted to remind her that Rudy raised Rudy, but the altering landscapes of the upas and the beasts that resided there had made Rudy quite confident in her independence. Don't give me that look. Your father made sure no harm came to you. He let you roam free within reason, her mother said, and that wasn't exactly how Rudy remembered it. But the outcome was a particular conversation tangent, usually ended in screaming and some blade crossing, and a few months of silence. Rudy really wanted that lightly crisping meat first. Well, I'm only here because you summoned me, O oh, wise elder. She muttered, not willing to say anything. The cooking slowed, and her mother looked over her shoulder at Rudy. A golden eye glinted, a look that Rudy had not seen too much since she had returned to Durance. Mana is getting to you, huh? Rudy crossed her arms, and Mila, Josie, a cooking grin show. A dangerous one. Says the brat whose horns are scraping my ceiling. She answered but turned fully, facing the growing slightly more neutral. The mime, how did it make you feel? She asked and Rudy met the golden eyes with the dark red ones. A little pushed, but the bugger had some weird powers. Why? Rudy replied, her tone matching the neutral expression. A silence dragged on for a small while as the cooking meat filled the kitchen. A slightly spicy aftertaste. Is this related to the reason you banned me and Quiss from giving Dal to the junk in our houses? You got annoyed if I gave her a dozen trees, and now you're poking about her mime. You and Pick are breathing down our necks more and more. You were furious. James went near the entrance with all his jaws. What's the deal? Rudy said without making any more preamble. It's related. Here. The old one pushed the plate of glistening rabbit meat at her. Rudy devoured one hole and took her time with the next one, waiting for her mother to continue. The other woman just moved around her house as if amused by it, as if not seeing it for a very long time. I forgot I had so many daggers, she said and plucked her hidden acid blade from the inside of Blade Care, Volume 52. I had forgotten so much, her mother added with a little bit of pain leaking through. She turned to see Rudy put the empty plate in the nearby table. Rudy, the dungeon needs to be watched. Anything happens, anything sticks out, you report it to me straight away. She finally said, Rudy raised an eyebrow. Like what? Rudy said, a cold note slipping into her tone, despite her trying to keep calm. Anything. First, despite your theories, we are still dealing with a dungeon. You cannot truly predict the plans or the games they play. Times of no consequence to them. You already are controlling the influencing it to a great degree, and with that damn fishing of yours. Be lucky I'm allowing you to enter at all, Mila snapped. Rooney crossed her arms, a fleeting image of a snapped homemade fishing rod pulled up to her unpleasant anger. Lucky, I don't need your permission to do what I want. I fought for that right. If I wanna go see Delta, I'll go. And I'm not telling you anything unless it's important. 
You want information so badly, you can visit Delta yourself. Rudy loomed over her, and Mila's lips went thin. I have defended your right to go laze about in the dungeon. Several people have questioned if they too are allowed to begin to influence the dungeon for their sports. This is a dangerous game we play with dungeons. Delta, the dungeon is nothing like we have ever truly seen before. The elders have to make sure that every step is accounted for, lest I send a bunch of children in there for study and the core turns. I'm not saying that this is what will happen, but I would be a fool to welcome such a thing with open arms. One thing at a time knits you the hunt, no rushing blindly over the cliff. Mina said with a calm voice that Rudy's nostrils fled. Then what are you so afraid of her finding? Rudy threw out, and Mina's face went stony. There is nothing left to find. Ask me no more. I refuse. Listen to me. I refuse to expand on this. As Haldi and Pick, I already know that you went to see them. Mila scowled and Rudy's next words cut off the pink flush and ran up her neck. I thought I was subtle, she shrugged, suddenly feeling like a 14-year-old girl who had been caught joyriding on her father's doom mare. Mina snorted. Subtlety with beasts you have. With people, you're a brick that has been set on fire and then bashed into someone's head. Go, take the nosy blonde with you. He's been stuck in the trap for the last ten minutes. Mila dismissed and began to pull out more of more knives. Ruli rumbled thanks for the food and left the house. His mother's silent stare, piercing her back. Chris was indeed hanging upside down in some odd net. He grabbed the thing and smoke appeared from his fingers, but the net held. You gotta turn the heat way up. She uses those things to hunt some really nasty bunkers. She called with a sigh and she bent down to avoid the scratching of wood arc that stood guard on her mother's door. She reached down and undid the knot. Chris crashed down to the ground with a yelp and a puff of grey smoke. I had that, he said irritated. He pushed the net off and dusted his coat with a brown. No luck, he guessed, seeing her glum expression. I thought I had her. You just pissed her off enough to be sloppy, but not too angry enough to kicking my ass. She neatly sidestepped the trap that would have shot her over the fence onto some soft compost pile. She pulled Quist out of the way of another net trigger, and they both stood in the street. So, three for three, all three elders are not speaking about something. I don't think they're a part of a cult because Haldi won't join anything that doesn't have cheese involved, and Pick spends all day in the second floor of the bar playing knuckles. Quist began to talk aloud as he paced. Are you sure, Delta, is sure that the... People that took the mime and his group were in the same space as the whole dungeon is in. Chris asked in the third time and Rudy felt the urge to pick him up and shake him until something came loose. Dalton was pretty sure. The mime was, well, we didn't disagree. And I only went there this morning. Did you know that there was a door there now? The goblins let me in. And let me tell you, you don't feel like an idiot until the goblin has to show you the secret code of a dungeon door. Rudy muttered and Quist blinked, but shook his head. This has to do with the void of manor and the lands until Delta came. Even I was struggling to keep myself going around here. Quist sat and Rudy looked around the town of Durance. She was saw trees growing beyond the meek attempts, flowers bursting through the walls and ground, birds of all types now actively spending time in Durance, the people walking with animation instead of the same routines, saying the same words. Some didn't even move from the spot at the bad days. It all had become a model of what a town should be, and even Rudy had to take breaks from the town to make sure that she wasn't becoming a shell of herself. Why did you come to Durance, Quis? She asked quietly, and the fire mage stood a rambling. You never asked me before why the sudden interest. Quis's tone didn't go neutral. It was simply Quis. Rudy felt a tense part of herself relax at the sound of it. If we're going to unearth the secrets around here, might as well start with you. She tried and Quist mumbled a word and waved a hand over Rudy. Nothing happened, but Quist looked like he'd received some bad news. What? Rudy asked quickly and Quist met her eyes. Our friendship level isn't high enough for you to hear my backstory. Please buy me more gifts at the bar, he said sagely. Rudy punched him in the arm, and the blonde man was sent crashing into the fence, but Rudy was too busy grinning. You're a jerk. Come on, I have an idea. 
which might be ridiculously stupid. She said and Chris picked himself up and, with a look of long suffering, trailed after her. How is that any different from your normal ideas? He asked and Rudy made a show of thinking about it. We may end up getting into the hellish plane, she said quite seriously. Chris gave her a long look. The abyss, he said with a quiet tone and Rudy's face fell. I wish... No. We're going back to school, she said, sounding almost afraid. Chris looked confused but followed her as Rudy piked herself up for the confrontation to come. Chris, how quickly can you do 15-year-old geography homework? She asked, sounding defeated. I'm pretty sure that the chronomancer can only affect their own time clock. Actual time travel is beyond possible. Maybe a version of yourself who did will appear. He's replying dryly, and the schoolhouse loomed silently closer. Ruly slowed and her feet almost rebelled as she saw the same old welcome sign and simplistic schoolyard with climbing frames and a sandbox. He was already waiting. Miss Ruly Monteroy Jose... Demon Blaine, I do believe that you are very late to class. Mr. Jones smiled at her. His perfect hair and firm pressed shirt looked like it was legendary in the fence against wrinkles. His tie never seemed to be out of place. Mr. Jones, we need to talk. Rudy grabbed the retreating quisps in his arm without looking back at him. Miss Rudy, please, I am your teacher. I always have time for you. He turned and walked into the school building. Rudy knew it. The building before her was not right. It looked like an atypical chapel turned into a school, but there was something about it that never quite fit into this reality. The windows always seemed to be completely unconnected to the rooms on the inside instead of appearing where they liked. The inside never changed so much as shifted, and they had been a few times Mr. Jones led them to a hall or a swimming pool despite the fact that no student could find those rooms or understand how the building could hold them. The few times that the number of students were higher than normal, the building somehow had just enough rooms for everyone. It was just the paint that got to Rudy the most. It was the same coat that had ever been there since she had been bad student of this place. Like Mr. Jones, the building itself was unaged in its quest to educate the young. It was red, and the paint was a deep, deep red, and it made something inside her head pulse with a warmth that even now she wasn't sure she understood. Your plan is to try to get information out of a knowledge demon. Not just anyone, but one that has never failed a student in his entire history of durance. Chris hissed and really looked at him, a weak smile on her face. Not quite right. He has one failed student. She laughed nervously, and Chris gave her a wide-eyed look. He's not going to let you leave until you pass. You cannot go in there. You're an idiot and can't do tests. He said furiously and Rooney looked at the building. She couldn't argue. A bead of sweat traveled down her neck. He's just going to run circles around you. We need a bargaining chip. I failed so many times and I went over the age of 18. And you know what happens when Mr. Jones has to teach adults. All the safety stuff comes off and he gets, uh, serious. Rudy climbed on the first step and then took a deep breath, as Chris was right at his side, no longer hesitating. Well, you're in luck. You have a strong chance of passing any test for one reason. Chris rolled his neck. Oh, yeah? Rudy smiled softly and Chris grinned, making his face stern, youthful and handsome, the fire making his eyes pulse with heat. You got the top-ranking student from one of the grandest magic schools in the land at your disposal. He said and Rudy felt hope rise in her chest. You. You. Rudy's smile froze as Quiz turned a little sheepish. Seth is sadly at the inn, but if you can't get out, I'll go grab him. I swear on my honor as the 497th ranked wizard in my school. He nodded and with pride. Rudy closed her eyes and counted to ten. She wallowed Quiz after four. Delta spun slightly around and stared towards the ceiling. Trees arched so high, they almost brushed the fake sky above. The jungle room was finally delivered on its name. Delta floated up with a smile and landed at the entrance of the room. From the door, she could no longer see the far wall or the river. The trees had grown to their full potential. She looked at the shimmering wylam tree above and the green manor flaking off, making the scene look mystical. Delta hadn't had to wait too long for the jungle to spread. 
the floors and thick foliage hiding the bees at the waterfall, and the short path led to the jungle where it began to curve with around some trees and vanish. It would lead those who followed it towards the log and river after a few excessive twists and turns. The fake path led off and looped up to give a sense of grandness to the place. A side path led to the circus that she planned to make others leading to various tunnels that she had yet to make. To be nice, Dalton put a few small wooden benches with clear view of the ceiling for those who needed a rest after getting turned around. About five or so, all the way to the far end of the room. Dalton drifted and saw the river, once exposed like a vein, now had shadows and branches overhead to make it almost a tunnel at places. The wood and the nature letting the starlight mushrooms to light up the area and a little at a time until from above. It looked like dozens of stars dancing amongst the trees. The starlight mushrooms had done wonderfully and fought the efficient methods against the blood-curdling mushrooms. A few times she let the black fungi grow under the dense trees in the darkest of shadows. She was trying to control them, not to lead them to rebellion. Dalta just kept a close eye on them for now. The log came across the river, now had a simple bridge next to it. Thankfully, New knew how to make the bridge work after some experimentation. Dalta just broke like a hard cookie when she sent Rady across it. But the log remained because Dalta had a challenge planned for it. She had a lot of challenges planned for this place now. A small shape darted past as Dalta bent down to pet the sniffing crimson rabbit. Its large ears twitched, but it accepted the touch, a very faint feeling. Dalton laughed as Rennie's powers allowed for such a wonderful thing. She got something from the contract too. Physical contact, however weak, with her monsters. Blood hair, critter, a small creature who sheds its coat many times a year due to the excess regeneration powers. The meat is said to be delicious. It is very quick and alert to all danger. It feeds on several of the plants in the jungle, and something may happen if the right plant is eaten. I like this one. It's very cute. Allow rabbits to breed. will stop at a maximum limit based on the room purchased. Allow blood hare to eat blood-curdling mushrooms 50 dp. Make them harder to catch, and the number of rabbits begins to be hunted. Purchased. The little bunny twitches its nose, and Delta steals herself. She knew she was setting them up to be hunted, but like the fish. The creature wasn't too upset when she informed it, and she had planned. I keep telling you, they are created knowing their purpose, and knowing that they will simply return in new shells to continue the act. Why would they be afraid? It's just weird, but I'm sort of happy they're okay with it. Dalta stood as the blood hair rushed off. Yes, it does make things easier. At least something goes well for us. Dalta hummed in agreement and went to one side of the far sides of the room. It rose gently up and to the point that she was almost equal to some of the treetops. A single cave-like corridor was set in the high elevation. It like some secret nest that only a bird could find. Dalta floated into the large room and almost the entire space devoted to a pond. Except for a single path that led to the middle of the pond, it held two statues, Rayon and Davina crossing spheres over the stairs that led down into the deepest part of the pond. This pond didn't look like a river or like the one above on the first floor. There was no fish in this pond, only a large thick lily pads that floated gently over a lot of the surface. The water glowed a deep green, and the clear water showed a smooth basin with still salt at the bottom. Delta had been messing around, and with experimentation found that if she put the pond into a layer, the room added some statues of her frogs. It unlocked the frog pond. Frog pond spawn room. Current monsters respawnable. Current amount of layers on level. Level 2, 1 out of 2. 2 out of 5 monsters set to the spawn. Rail and Divina. Upgrades. All frogs' monsters gained the sight enhancement and strength due to Rail's efforts, 30 dp. All frog monsters gained increased nature awareness due to Divina's efforts, 30 dp. The frog pond had a feeling of some powerful shrine, and Delta felt a little like an intruder, but Divina walked casually up to the pond stairs, her large eyes focused on the entrance. Mother, the water is great. I feel so refreshed. 
Divina sounded pleased as she rested casually against Rail's statue, admiring the defined muscles of the statue for a moment. I'm glad. Where's Rail? Delta wondered, and Divina rolled her eyes. Where else? The gym you gave him. He's been lifting those rocks like his life depends on it. She said with a sigh. It's not too high up in here, is it? Delta changed the subject as it rather let them work out whatever was going on between Rail and Davina. No, it is perfectly reachable via the trees and some quick climbing. I have such a grand view of the jungle. She said and peered out of the tops of the trees and glowed points of mushrooms. I feel like I can almost hear the new side of the jungle that I could not before. Davina closed her eyes. Are you going to become a witch doctor? Delta asked, remembering one of the base classes that the frog people could become. Davina tilted her head. I think so. It's almost as if the jungle whispers to me. She tried to explain, and Delta opened up her upgrade menu. Davina, a female frog who has shown a great interest in the jungle itself. She sings when no one is around, but I hear it, and it's nice. Frog Warrior, a frog man who has taken the art of fighting to the next level, 15 DP. Frog Shadow, a frog man who has been one with the jungle shadows, 15 DP. Frog Witch Doctor, a frog who can bend the nature of the jungle, 15 DP. Frog Chieftain Rare, the leader of the frog tribesmen. It gains bonuses when the tribe thrives. Only one may exist at a time, 20 DP. Delta eyed her resources. Four mana, 20 DP. Do you want to evolve? Delta asked gently and Divina smiled wildly, her face looking peaceful at the thought. I would like that very much, Divina answered, and Delta lightly grasped Divina's hand, making the frogwoman grasp at the contact. Delta hit the menu and Divina glowed. Maybe he'll finally look at me. Divina mused and her features were lost in the glowing light. End of chapter There is no epilucia, only puns. Chapter 49 Witching Hour if a jungle had a heart, what would it sound like? There were many possibilities, and Divina could only ever imagine how one jungle might be more otherworldly than whatever vision she dreamt up. As a base frogman, Divina admired the greenery, the growing trees, and the budding life that came from mother's whims and plans. As a current self, Divina was the very nature that grew around her as she walked. She inhaled the tiny secrets appeared at the tip of her tongue. She gently brushed a tree and it gave her an enduring strength. She kissed the flowers and she knew the beauty that appeared after the long trials and much effort. She stepped into the river and learned about change. The heart of the jungle sounded like a bad jokes and humming. Divina hummed along as if she had to create an echo of greatness. But Divina's voice created no life or any wonderful gifts for her dungeon. Mother Delta fussed over something on the first floor with the guidance of New. She let the bee gently tend to the pollen as she had gathered her long skirt. It buzzed as if some gratitude and floated away, so small and yet so wonderfully part of something bigger. As the workers tended to the hive, the frogs worked for the dungeon. Divina hummed as she navigated the rapid-growing jungle, learning which parts were true dead ends and which were merely appeared to be so, which trees held warmth and ample space, and which held poor footing and gruff attitudes towards fleshy creatures stepping all over their branches. Divina gave a bow to the red rabbit that followed her. Greetings, Sir Rabbit, she said, and the rabbit sniffed at her leg and then scratched its now pollen-covered nose. It blinked in her pink eyes and her, and then hopped away casually, almost sleepily as it knew that there was no danger. Divina saw it nibble at some of the plants, after which the plants grew back, slightly bigger and harder, which made the bees spread their pollen with joy, which they then returned to the hive to produce honey to serve the queen. Did the circle end there? Divina shook her head, and she appeared to under the great spires of the bee. The honey was secure by a faint amount of trickling down the rock, creating a glistening glow on the surface. From there the moss grew around it and a wonderful scent wafted out into the dungeon. The final piece of the dungeon circle would be the humans. They would take the honey and give it back to Mother Delta with their essence. 
Then it would flow back into the rabbits and bees. It would flow endlessly into the wonderful circle of growth. Divina inhaled and shuddered as the bees buzzed in unison, singing as they collected, singing as they returned, singing as the queen praised them. Divina knew that the beans did not use such open emotions. It was like how she knew that frogs and their differences from the frog people. Did Mother the Delta give them these fragile things, emotions, as a test? Her heart in such a short time had learned pain, love, determination, ambition, and amusement, sadness. Rael, her counterpart, seemed to have no trouble with his emotions. He strode forward with every action filled with utter loyalty and certainty. There was a way that sure his purpose made his skin glow and his eyes pierce through with a silent judgment. Her heart. Now she felt so much more than she allowed to utterly overwhelm her senses. The jungle was just but a fraction of Mother's world. How could she experience such connections, such understanding of this level and not feel awed at everything? It was Davina's entire world, and it felt so big, but Davina knew of an entire world outside of the dungeon, and her knees went weak at the thought of such an expansive space. She could barely handle the sight before her. You've been standing there for a long time. Master knew I welcome your company. She smiled and pushed back her new mask. A design on it all made her pause, but she pushed it aside as the blue box moved closer. So, I see Delta finally upgraded you. How does it feel? Divina chewed over the thought for a long time, giving a proper focus it deserved. I am myself, but I am now myself more than I was. Some secret parts of me have bloomed, and I wonder how I could have been so arrogant or blind about who I was. She trailed off and you was quiet. It's an odd feeling, understanding that you are something more than you ever were meant to be. You will adjust. It is simply life. Even non judgment people change in such a way. Life is fair in that respect. I do not know how to act. Everything is too much, but I do not want to fail mother. She whispered and the trees around her seemed to close in, trapping her. I assumed as much. I have some guidance. Davina blinked as someone cursed the foliage and scrambled through the leafy underground towards her. Short green, one fang too long, a staff in one hand and a mushroom in the other. That's her. He asked gruffly and you paused. Swan, this is Davina. I'm glad that you have finally found your way here. How do you feel? Davina watched the goblin flick his fingers and some sparks appeared. The sight of the fire evoked a primal fear inside Divina, and she took a step backwards. Weak, like stupid numb. I want to go back to first level. This place worse than Grove. Swan grumbled, and Divina felt a spark of protectiveness rising up from the goblin's words. Your tunnel is welcome to you, and a grand jungle has no time for buffoons. She said waspishly, and the maid, Swan, grinned. Divina narrowed her eyes. She got some sparks. Yeah, I can see that. Swan mumbled, and he peered at Davina. Evolved, did you? Not exactly unique, but you know, it's all the same. He said and poked her with his staff. Davina narrowed her eyes, and all around them whispers began. Swan didn't look impressed. You thinks because you new and shiny that you can scare me. You feel like top of the world and not real at the same time. You think that you can act brave when you clearly can't handle the evolution all that great. Swan sneered, which made Davina pause. You're evolved as well. You're one of the goblins from above. She pondered and allowed, trying to think of the first level. Swan grinned and looked like he was trying not to laugh. The first unique, the very first. I'm Swa, the pyromancer. You need not bow as a fellow monster. Fra seemed to lean on his staff as if to wait for Davina's answer. She merely used the tree behind her for support. Davina, second evolution of the second floor, beaten by the queen in a manner. I'm the witch doctor. She added and Swa frowned. Odd name. What exactly do witch doctor doctor plants? He asked, looking almost fondly at the surrounding mushrooms. Davina hesitated, a series of motions bubbling up, and she picked the most reasonable one. I do not know yet. Everything is too new. She tried to explain softly, but Swa merely snorted. New is only one part. You are afraid of this power. How silly. 
He scoffed, which made Davina's back stiffen. Watch your tongue, goblin. She hissed and swore, which only made the goblin grim. Little Big Missy gets new power and gets too scared to try it out. Numb gonna laugh about this. Knowing mother, I bet she asked. So, really, you said yes, so why you afraid? He tilted his ugly head with amusement as smoke curled its way from his nose. It was then that she had noticed New had been silent the entire time. You don't just throw your power out and expect the balance to be the same. I must test everything with respect and do things promptly. Davina said with a glare and Swar rubbed the leaf between his fingers. Black smoke appeared. So what you're saying is you need a problem to solve. Swar beamed and the cherubic innocence. Davina felt her skin grow cold. No, it's not what I said. But she was cut off as Swar's hands lit up in a smoldering flame. I can make a problem. I am very good at making problems. He promised and laughed with a high-pitched cackle. Master knew. She turned and knew seemed to think on it. As long as he does no permanent harm, I think I agree. You watch too much. A fine thing for a frog tribesman. Not so for a new witch doctor. Swan laughed again and the bush caught fire on the side. Davina shrieked and knew dinged with amusement. She kicked up some dirt on the smoldering the injured rond as best as she could. She turned as the snarl on her lips towards Swa, who was frowning. Still thinking like a frog. Need to start thinking like a doctor witch. She said simply and threw some fire out at the isolated plants. Divina could logically see that the flames wouldn't do much in the wet air and the wetter plants, but it still triggered some deep fear inside that made her react. She reached over and slammed her fist into the goblin's face. This is how I think with rail on my mind. She screeched and swore, stumbled back, swatting his dented nose. That's not magic, he protested, and Davina reached for him again. I cast fist in your face. She shouted and leapt at him. Swa made a screaming noise and bolted for the underbrush. The trees whispered in protest and Davina followed the sounds to easily catch up with Swa. Problem was that a panic Swa tended to uh, catch fire. He was beginning to set more fires than he would be able to control and Davina's heart went bleak at the sight. She needed to stop this. She needed to stop this. Davina thought of Mother, how she set her mind to anything, and it happened due to the sheer wonderful wishful thinking and hard work. Davina closed her eyes and wished so hard that her heart hurt. She wished that she could control the new power. She wished that she could be great for her mother. She wished that Rail would finally speak to her. She wished there was no more fire. It didn't work so she did what Mother did best. She screamed at the dungeon until something happened. She bellowed and grasped at the air, no longer keeping a peaceful appearance to the world. Something glowed around her hands, and she thrust it out. A wispy orange form flew near the river and began to swirl. From the clear water, much tinier blue spheres appeared, and then the river rose and crashed over the burning foliage and the goblin alike. There was a beat of silence and the orange wisp floated closer. Divina held out her hand and cupped it gently. It looked up to Divina and she could swear that she almost saw a tiny face before it faded. What the heck was that? Divina clutched the now empty space between her hands and closed it to her chest. The spirits guide me. They... I am no druid. I hear no jungle heart. I hear its soul. She called and her vision blurred for a moment, and she saw a sea of orange sprites, floating mana wisps. Oh, well done. I guess I should do something dalterish for the moment, as she's trying to communicate with the system. Ah, uh, I guess your soul searching is over? Davina felt her own soul curl up and wince, but she put out a polite smile as Swan washed downstream, screeching his little voice out. Davina was about to reluctantly help him when her heart froze. It stuttered and her mind went from the wonders of the jungle in this mysterious soul beings to... Ah, it's real! She pointed out stupidly at the large figure thundering down the river. Halt and be rescued! Rail yelled at the screeching Swa. Can we not tell Delta I almost drowned Swa to help you learn a lesson? Just as a favor? Divina just stared at the screen. You know, I do as much work around here. I deserve some respect.
Davina curled up her hands and wisps appeared again. They felt warm and curious. I used to respect you more before you went mad with power. She admitted a news box deflated. One time. Tea? Coffee? I have some juice boxes around here. Mr. Jones offered politely as Rooney and Quiz took seats opposite his desk. I'll take a dragon on the rocks. Don't skip on the rocks. Rudy grinned, and Mr. Jones raised one eyebrow. It arched just enough to look intrigued and enticing. Are you suggesting I have alcohol on the premises? His tongue clicked inside of his mouth, and Quiz quickly spoke before Rudy could bury herself deeper. Of course not. Thank you for seeing us. I know being a soul teacher means that you have a lot of work to grade up and lessons plans to do. Quiz began politely and calmly. Mr. Jones merely smiled. One could say I'm already doing them as we speak. Have done them, will do them. It's hard to tell on Tuesdays, he said with a serious tone. Quiz hesitated and looked at the man before him. As someone who came to Durance after already finishing his education and having no kids of his own, he and Jones never really had any reason to speak to each other. The man never had any problems that he needed a peacekeeper for. In fact, Quiz was sure that the man never did anything that required other people. Shopping, haircuts, small talk, drinking, clubs, hunting, painting, dating. Mr. Jones seemed to be an example of time immortalized rather than an example of its effects on people. Time travel is impossible. Quiz nodded and Mr. Jones looked intrigued. His simple but charming smile curving slightly. Oh, traveling of the time spiral is indeed beyond anyone, but more than the physical shells can pass through its tender grasps and remain intact. Information has a tendency to linger in the very air, despite all evidence being removed of its presence. A blot on the very existence of time's neat book. A single moment of time that is forever crystallized and for all to see. Jones clapped his hands together. Ah, I hated metaphysics on Tuesdays. Rudy muttered, which made the teacher smile. You did often like to get upset and promptly suggest that time sorts itself out and move on like the rest of us. He quoted with amusement, and Rudy scratched her nose. I sucked at school. Let's not beat her bush over the head. She said gruffly, which made Joan's smile turn even large. It's never too late to learn something new. She reminded, and Quiz felt uneasy, and the view outside of the windows seemed to be slightly further away than he remembered. We are here about whatever the elders are hiding, being the fact that you're one of the six or so people who doesn't answer to them or is afraid of them, we thought that we could get some good info from you. Rudy explained, ignoring Jones's comment. They have many secrets, and you are vastly wrong. Only a fool does not fear those three working in synergy. I see that even now they are returning to themselves. Interesting. Tell me, Chris, how was your education? I heard you studied in Hobbiton, an esteemed magical school. I knew a few people there. He said and Rudy looked at him with confusion, but Quiz decided to let the knowledge demon play his games for now. I did. I knew no one from there, bar Seth and my teacher. Why did you become a teacher? He fired back, playing into Jones's hands. Quiz went no fool. He had been instructed on how most demons worked with reason. Mr. Jones was a knowledge demon. They appreciated wits, the thirst for curiosity, and were one of the few demons that didn't often make one sell their magic or soul for information. They preferred their own cocktail of temptations, rare secrets and softly simmered confessions of the heart. It suited my needs best. Now, I heard you and Sethimus had a very interesting teacher. Is this true? He smiled as he leaned back in his chair. Alani Serenagor. Even saying the name made Quist's palms turn sweaty. Unbidden images of a small woman with a large smile flashed across her mind. Jones's smile faded with a thin line. My condolences. Even in the abyss, she was a name to be respected. Your tea. He encouraged and Quist took her down the cup, and he was sure that he hadn't accepted. Rudy looked at them and tried to look casual. Sounds important. She's some bigwick in the magical nerd school. She asked bluntly, and Jones closed his eyes with some unseen emotion, but Quiz shrugged. She was a witch, a proper one, but she dabbled with mages, and she ended up liking the title. She was the last fighter of the Battle of the Ruths. Quiz explained, voice hollow. Rooney's eyes bulged out, and she almost knocked her chair over as she stood up. You were taught by the hero of the world, Tree. She demanded, and Quiz just gave her a very cold look. She hesitated and sat back down. 
Be glad you flunked, Miss Rudy. I hate to have you sent to detention for all insensitivity. Jones sighed and then clapped his hands together. But let us gossip and barter like frail old ladies that hide cursed death charms in the purses, shall we? He asked, changing the subject completely. The classroom's air turned from a business-like professional to something more relaxed and loose. It made Chris's teeth stand on edge. Mila, Pick, Haldi, and Durance, four youths who came to this land. How do their stories line up with yours? Jones inquired, his desk longer than Chris remembered. Jones opened the drawer and retrieved a book. It was an abyssian, and Chris had no idea how to read it. Teasing, plot, twist, and annoying your fellows. Are you serious? Rudy grumbled, and Jones laughed. I took it off my student, Grimoire. He does enjoy having the edge over his fellows. Please, continue. He nodded to them both pleasantly. Rudy looked insured, but Chris's mood was at a low point, and he had no real motivation to parley with a demon. Durance, what happened to him? Who is the lord of the path of the ending light? Chris asked bluntly, and Jones turned the page as he read with no reaction to the names. One is a town, and the other has a too long a title. Would be my guess. He responded dryly, and Rudy sighed. Chris, come on, don't be all agitated. You're just going to agree with something or say something, and that's that. She reminded him, Jones hummed. You could always put gum on and glue it on my chair. That worked well for a certain brat. He offered and rudely suddenly met his eyes. I was eleven. You talked too much. She defended herself and Jones closed the book. And now you're thirty-two and I'm not saying a word. It isn't interesting in how times have changed. Yes, he beamed, his black hair so perfectly cut. Delta, the dungeon, is digging deep. She's finding pieces of this history. You have a duty as a knowledge demon to retain and pass on this information. Chris placed the cup of tea back onto the coffee table. He paused and saw the room was the teacher's lounge. It looked okay, but something nagged at Chris that made him aware that something wasn't right. Wasn't there a desk before? My duty is wherever I make it. My obligations as a keeper of knowledge is now a task of imparting knowledge to children. You are not my student, nor will you ever be. What obligation do I owe you? Jones asked, voice flat. Mr. J, come on. Remember how I passed that one test and how I almost passed all the others, and that one time I accidentally did my homework because I thought it was a quiz on what my favorite weapon was. Rudy tried and Jones eyed her before sighing. You and those pigtails, you came into class with monster fluids all over you, and with some packed lunch that still twitched. It was honestly a trial of my career until the last few years. Dio Brondo has really pushed my patience, but I cannot say that I dislike the boy. He smiled, and Chris could agree on that at least. Jones was quiet for a moment and then clicked his fingers. The building around them quivered, and a series of clanging noises echoed out before Jones spoke. There is a reason that you do not and will not know. Knowledge is a river. It flows in and sometimes it can dry up. This particular knowledge is like a parasite that lives in the water. It burrows deep and infects your waking thoughts to the point that you change. It is not about treating you like children, nor about not trusting you. This information is literally dangerous, and inside your unprepared minds, you will simply crumble like worms under a crow's foot. Jones said, and his perfect appearance seemed to lose some of its parts, and being with many eyes sat before them. The eyes were all different shapes and colors. In the middle of it all, an around black orb beating like a heart before Jones returned to human form, clearing his throat. Did you not find it bizarre that your mother began to forget things? Haldi, Pick, the very town became a routine of dolls and repeated plays of scenes. This land is very hungry, and they have poured a very essence of themselves into the land to forget. Now, this dungeon has made a thing more impossible. It seems almost like a perfect counter. The elders must see this altar as a form of interference by the gods or devils. Who knows? Maybe an old foe trying to gain an upper hand. He spread his arms and Chris moved on to the lunch hall bench and he glared at the menus. He was sure something was going on here in the school. He had was somewhere with coffee, but hadn't they always been talking in the lunch hall? What is it? What old foe? Rudy pushed, and Jones put on his chin in his hand, smiled almost crooked. 
the three lords, the one of the ending light, the one of the settled darkness, and the one of the broken silence, each guarded by their night. What lies below them? I have no clue, but that isn't just the dangerous part. Knowing numbers and titles is fine. You'll be fine. And when you know their nature, you hear the name, you are at war. Jones whispered and Quist stumbled. He turned to say something, but Jones shut the school door in his face. It left him standing there on the stone steps without Rudy at the school building, before him seemed to be locked and all the windows and doors. Doing exactly what Quiz feared that he would do, re and roll Rudy back into his class. Quiz walked towards the window and tried to smash it open. After, knocking on the door did nothing. The rock he threw stretched the glass and simply flung it back at Quiz. Quiz itched to click his fingers and turn it on the spot, remembering his promise and the only known weakness of knowledge demons, a gifted genius and an idiot. Thankfully he knew just the water mage who could fulfill both ends of the claws just fine. Lords, and their knights below and unknown, Delta, Endurance. Questions, questions, questions. I missed the days that I could set things up on fire and then go home to sleep. He admitted and mumbled an apology as the new banker girl knocked into him. She looked at him and Quist didn't say anything as he rushed on. The girl burst her lip and her bloodshot eyes looked around like the lively people with some sorrow. She watched as the people laughed, as the grass and flowers bloomed, as manna flowed from the air and bringing life. She turned and ran back to her shop to curl up on her bed, her ovens cold and her bread hard as rock. She just lay there, hoping Durance's curse would just take her. End of chapter. There is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 50. Evolution of the First Floor Hob and Gob emptied their buckets, and Delta eyed the discarded potato peelings, holy socks, empty cans, and more than a few candy wrappers. The other bucket had the usual collections. Did you go into the city? She asked, waiting to hear the Goblin story before getting upset. Gob shook his head. Dio found us and gave us stuff. He said he'd come back soon. The Goblin grinned, happy to have found some loophole in getting things from the village without casually breaking any of Delta's rules. Dio, the thing Delta never planned for and most likely could never hope to do so. That's great, great work, Delta praised, tasting the day-old potatoes and just a sliver of chocolate. Poor chocolate added to menu, potato added to menu, smelly sock added to menu. Thank you, it smells different. Delta looked down at the cheerful goblins, both eagerly talking about the next harvest. On a whim, she opened up the gob's menu. Gob, goblin, contracted, a young goblin who survived the goblin hunting camp. He is a brother to a hob. He finds purpose and pride in gathering for all the dungeon. He spots things more than hob, but lacks the strength to carry as much as hob. Equipped, wooden sword, wooden armor, and helmet. Class, 75% unknown. Evolution, 22% goblin thug. Goblin archer, unknown. I know gob can do it. Delta blinked, a class and an evolution. Classes were a thing. She knew Swa was a pyromancer, but that seemed more like a power than a title to go with it. Her contracted monsters could gain a class. Or was it all her monsters? Delta closed the menu and pondered the goblins ran off. What's the difference between a class and an evolution? Oh, a better question. Do real people have classes, or is this a dungeon thing? She asked the empty air around them and smiled at the nearby wall. You can stop hiding and answer. I know you're dying to. She called and new shimmered into view with a sad ding. I thought you weren't paying attention. But yes, I would very much like to show you how smart I am. Delta rolled her eyes and just waited for new to come closer. Classes are mantles one can wear around themselves to increase abilities and growth in their area. It differs from evolution because, with evolving, the being itself becomes the class instead of the class gradually shaping and enhancing the person. One could say that they are almost two ends of the road in which one can travel. People outside may have them, and does seem highly rare from the information that I gleaned from the visitors thus far. Rare as they must have their entire being into one such area, and very few people can live, dream, eat, love, and weep and cherish something, enough to give up that type of devotion over spending out of enjoying all of life's gifts. Delta could see that, but pointed down the hall to her gobs. And them? 
They have both going on. She pointed out and you hesitated, as if thought of an answer. Mostly because they are goblins. Simple-minded living is what they excel at, since they do not last long in the outside world. Classes would be rather easy for them. Evolution is simply inherited from their monster side. I've never seen a wild monster gain both at the same time, though. Rennie, as you could see, has a very strong mime power, but that is mostly from a class. You could no easier tear that mime from Rennie than his coolness. Come with me. New turned and floated down the hall, and Delta followed easy enough. So monsters can do both. Can people do both? Can people evolve? She pondered and New chimed with interest. Evolution is something that one can or cannot do. Anyone with enough will can earn a class if they truly desire it. Evolution is not a thing that can just work at. It is built into a person. So if people could evolve, they must utterly change themselves, be part other, or because a creature of carnage, death, and hate to rival a monster. Well, that would be normal people. I have no clue on a dungeon contract, people. We should test this somehow. Nalta decided that she didn't like the way the news box was humming, so she silently decided to stall contracting anything on the next floor that she made until she was absolutely sure that it deserved to be there. It was a valuable power, and Dalta must have been a little... How would you say that, uh, trigger-happy? New slowed and moved into the secret passage where a soft ambient drumming echoed out. This should offer more information on your questions. New said as they stood before the greater Mushi, his wicked, torn tentacles tapping, plucked and clanging various things in a melody only now to itself. Hey, sounds great. Have you got a name for it? Delta grinned at the mushroom. It paused and then waved a vine in a negative way. Well, if you ever throw a concert, let me have a front row seat, she asked seriously, and the mushroom slowly hesitated and nodded. Greater Mushi began a new tune. It was slow, but had a few spread out high notes and a tiny lyre Delta had made for him. It was pretty nice, and Delta hummed along as she opened the menu. Greater Mushi, Great Mushi, an evolved mushroom spitter that, due to the dungeon's nice nature, has never killed anyone. After a long time of boredom, it began to use music as a way to pass the time. It has become quite good. Evolution unlocked due to the evolution of two or more advanced mushrooms. Unknown, unknown, unknown special evolution. Class 36%. If Davina and Great Mushy will combine their musical talents, I would very much like that. Great Mushy had both as well. If he got the bar class and evolved into a musical mushy, would he be twice as strong? Delta asked, head buzzing with curiosity. Interesting, isn't it? I suspect the free will that you give all create is what is causing this fascinating anomaly. The will to be who you wish, and the origin of a dungeon to love for the sheer change. Potent, but ultimately a gamble. We cannot force someone to love something, nor can we halt the natural growth of the monster side. That's fine. I mean, it's up to me to make the dungeon a safe so that monsters can focus on themselves. She reminded him and hummed the great mushy song some more. Then I eagerly await what you'll do next. In fact, the first floor does need some improvements to make it overall a lot better. We have the basics. Now we need the proper touches. Hmm, I will be right back. So I finally decided to head to the second floor to help me with Davina's uh, issue. Please do carry on. Do blinked away and Delta raised an eyebrow. I never know what's going on in my own dungeon. She muttered and waved goodbye to the musical fungi. Davina did seem a little distracted when she evolved. I wonder if she'll be able to get a class. Hmm, what if she got the witch doctor's class on top of already being a witch doctor monster? Would she be a witch witch doctor doctor? Delta asked herself if the idea made her head hurt a little. I missed the days when building new rooms were all I had to get confused over. She smiled fondly, having no real idea of how much time she had actually passed. She could have built a rudimentary clock if she tried hard enough, or asked for one from Durance, but she honestly didn't want to torment herself by the time when she was happy to float around from task to task. Knowing how long she had been in the dungeon core wouldn't make any difference. It would only depress her. Good thing there is no Delta menu. She laughed and the orange box appeared. 
Delta, Dungeon Core, Mana, 40 out of 90, DP, 75, Floors, 2, Total Monsters, 15. Available, Contract Offers, 0, Total Number of Kills, 17. Titles, Mushroom Queen, Devour and Eat Many Dangerous Mushrooms, Then Grow Your Own. Employer, You Get a Contract, You Get a Contract, Everyone Gets a Contract. First Floor Developer, You Maxed Out the Total Rooms on the First Floor. Dungeon of Love, Foster and embrace people is something more than food. Dungeon of punishing jokes. The dungeon has taught her monsters terrible jokes. Mothering nature. Grow a lot of nature-related items and monsters. Captain Hook. Create a respectable fishing spot. Corrupter. Infect the system and menu with life. <laughs> Survived. <laughs> Refuse to fade. Unknown. Return to the world in one form or another. Delta swallowed back a noise that definitely didn't convey confidence. I should really know better to speak before I think, she muttered as she dismissed the screen. Delta looked down at the ground. She could get upset to the harsh reminder of what she had lost, or she could get her head screwed on right and get to work. Delta chose wisely and walked forward in a cheerful smile. Then walked past and Delta bent down to speak to him. Where are you off to? She asked and Numb looked serious. To lift with whale. Must be strong like Dio. He bellowed and rushed off with tiny rocks under his arms. Strong is one word to describe that kid, she admitted. Scary as hell as another. She added and entered the spider room a moment later, deciding to work from the front to the back. It hadn't changed much other than the spiders learning about monarchy and taking turns to be the royal leader for an hour or so. Currently, it was King Gustaweb, the first of his name, ruling. He had just taken over from Queen Silklegs. Hey yo, she called out, and all the spiders waved in greeting from the berry bush where the throne was. She hummed as the spiders all took turns serving as the new ruler, doing dances and facing each other in a berry swinging contest, or even balancing on the tripwire. Very medieval, but Data would allow it because they were cute. She opened the menu with interest. Spider room. Upgrade spiders. Locked. Upgrade total number of spiders that can be in this room. 5 DP. Restore trap after the dungeon is empty. Purchased. Make spiders more durable and less likely to die. 10 DP. Make the greater amount of berries wilt after each spider that dies. Purchased. Make the berries plumper and enriched with mana. Makes them good for eating and recovering strength, but too many will upset the stomach. 10 DP. If enough spiders are killed to walk the entire bush spawn, the optional ghost mini-boss Spidergeist, who will disappear when the spiders respawned, 20 DP. The heck is a Spidergeist? Delta muttered as she shrugged. It sounded like the first room protection, if nothing else, and she couldn't really upgrade the spiders yet. So, she purchased it. The room went a little odd, and it unfelt wind brushed the webs aside. Delta looked around the room as all the spiders, including the kin, began to do some circular dance, with two of their legs up in the air. Delta followed the dance of the roof of the room. There, almost impossible to see, due to the thing's body being almost transparent and surrounded by the white webs, was a spider that easily dwarfed anything else in the room. Maybe just under the height of a goblin, but easily bigger on the sides. It uncurled its large eight see-through legs as if testing them. Its only color, the eight glowing red eyes, like stars on the white sky, peered right at her. Delta froze, and the spider closed its eyes and then vanished. She couldn't see it. She knew it was there due to her funky dungeon core senses, but she couldn't see it. Delta whipped her head around, struck in something gripping fear paralysis. Then, right next to her face, eight red eyes opened and blinked at her. She screeched and fled the room in the great amusement to all of the spiders who fell on the floor curling in laughter. The spider-geist watched her go and then moved to the top of the room, heavy with sleep, heavy until needed. Or was it her turn to be the queen? They would call her Queen Muffet, the song the creator was singing with joy in the distance, so loud and piercing, told of such a spider. It would be her title. More music, Delta whispered to the great mushy as she hid in the secret passage. A familiar tune picked up and Delta shivered. Itsy Bitsy isn't so itsy, trust me, she said with a sigh. 
The mushroom seemed to judge her, and she glowered at him. I have fears, and they're perfectly irrational. When they go from thumb size to can eat my dog size, she defended herself as the tune churned faster. Yeah, yeah, I'm going, but skip the spider songs. I don't even know how you know them. Am I leaking onto your playlist? She asked, worried, that the fungi had played on. She looked up at the glow moss for help, but they did naught but glow in merriment. Guess I'll go upgrade the storeroom while I'm here. She said, and the door opened on its own accord, and she walked through into the storeroom. A single straw room gave the room some wonderful atmosphere. She frowned as the while as the room had a manner vent. It lacked any of her usual oomph. It was just the front for her secret door. That didn't make Delta happy, so she rolled up her sleeves an orange-tinted shirt creased. First off, she grinned and zapped the table into existence. Would the good sirs and ladies enjoy some refreshments? She asked to no one and made a wooden plate and a bunch of ham sandwiches set into the pyramid pattern. Next, she set a bowl of berries and apples next to it. With a laugh, she formed a clay jug with fresh water. Feeling cheeky, she dropped in a few berries into it to give the water some flavor. Another clay ball formed with a sparrow egg, fresh and ready to be cooked if needed, and then as an added bonus a plate of sliced mushrooms. All in all, they took only 15 mana and made her stop. Open the menu, she requested, and the storeroom menu appeared with a flourish. Storeroom. Bonus. All simplistic and material items cost 50% less when spawned in this room. As long as it is simple and handy to the curious adventurer, it is cheaper. This is due to the mana vent. All rooms built over a mana vent gain passive bonuses. Keep all food fresh until removed from its container 5 dp. Make all the food rot if all the food is taken more than needed or by greed 10 dp. Allow simple foods to automatically be added to the buffet table 8 dp. Summon a unique monster, merry to allow the challenge, choosing the chase to be challenged by adventurers 15 dp. Delta eyed the last one with a narrow glare. No way. First it was Bob, then it was the giant spider. You think I'm just going to gamble on this random monster and challenge to make my cooler more interesting pantry worth seeing? Delta trailed off. There was a beat of silence and she finished it. It's a terrible idea. She stated bluntly as her finger smashed into the option. I mean, if I admit it, then I can't be told that I was wrong. She said brightly, and the room felt the same until Delta looked down at the brown mouse wriggling free of the berry bowl. It squeaked and twitched its nose. Ah, Delta said, and the coo, and then the mouse jumped, sending apples rolling as it went wild exploring its new home. It jumped on the shelf, and then the thing wobbled as the mouse was being chased by some hurricane. The shelf toppled, and the next one followed, and the mouse went soaring and the table and unended, sending the food splattering across the wall. Delta screamed as she chased the demon, swatting at it before it made her more of a mess. She never saw the tiny box appear. Room reset in five minutes. Challenge shit. Catch Mary before all Mary Hull breaks loose. Did I do that right? Delta, I hope I did it right. End of chapter. That, my friends, concludes this episode. I hope that you enjoyed. If you wish to support the author of the story, there will be a link to below. If you wish to support this channel, there are multiple ways to do so, which will all also be linked below. But the easiest way would be to subscribe and share my videos as much as possible. And until next time, I hope you all have a good one. And I'll see you all in the next video. Cheers.